Dear Von Mahan, Anocht, kind et tacht feelinge. Welcome, and tonight's talk we're talking about the importance or the way that truth works. <laughs> Before we start tonight, I'd like to give a shout out to Kelly Parkinson, who's been loyally with me from the start. Um, I depend on my patrons to be able to put these things together. I'd like to give a shout out to Eilish Nureda, also to Marnie Crony, uh, to Melinda Gardner, and to McConnell Toronto, who's a writer and filmmaker, who will be with us for a little while. Well, Tommy de Kaitanacht, Er, Unschli, Ibrin, Unirin. We're talking tonight about how truth works in different cultures. In the visual culture, in other words, a culture which is based on knowledge acquired through vision, books, literature, what we have in the West, if you like, in Western civilization, you can modify the truth or change it, or accounts of things and so on, as time goes by. Uh, and that's a very good facility to have in the overall scheme of things. But that it doesn't work in all cultures. For example, in our own indigenous culture, we were an oral or oral tradition, which meant that you learned everything from the ear, not the eye. And the memory associated with that is very different physically to the memory associated with the eye. For one thing, the amount of information that the eye takes in in any one second is colossal, and therefore it ignores most of what it feeds in through the eyes, the memory concentrates on what is different to what it has seen the previous second. Uh, but in the oral tradition and the oral receptor, there isn't half as much information coming in, so it's easier to retain stuff. And in our indigenous, in the Irish civilization and culture, we did everything orally. And the ramifications of that are quite large. For example, to me you had to memorize everything of, of what from a knowledge point of view, to pass it on to the next generation. And therefore, their bardic schools, which were up there to say the 14th, 15th centuries, when the, 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 the um, kind of genocidal uh, English domination of Ireland, pushed them underfoot, they went into bardic schools, which are into uh, hedge schools, which are illegal and so on. But <clears throat> in the original bardic schools, they taught everything through meter and rhyme and rhythm. And so to the outside eye, looking at this from a visual tra tradition, they thought that all they were doing all the time was learning reams and reams of stuff and meters and so on. But what was actually happening is they were teaching the students in the Bardi schools the rudiments and weapons and tools of learning orally and retaining in their memory large tracts of stuff. So we, I've noticed, for example, in recent years, we have a knock of the fall, which is kind of a, a, a very weak attempt at a bardic school of our own. Um, and we, in one of the schools there, we study Abranichta and Shannos are singing the old way, which is oral transmission, if you like. And I've noticed over the years, we're at it now, the bones of 20 years, um, it's, it's very interesting to see how we home in on, instinctively on the little potholes that are in the metre of a song or where the syllables have the wrong count or where uh, a name or something seems slightly off. And that's because we've learnt by osmosis, if you like, metre and rhythms and syllabic uh, modules and so on. And that's vitally important to keep this pattern so that instantly you know if a word has been changed. Now, what's the harm in changing a word? Well, in folk music there's no harm because in folk music what happens is you have the words of a song and the music of a song in a local area, in Bavaria or in Hammersmith or in Westmead or wherever, um, and they sing the song about 
Johnny did this and that and the other and the uh, love story and whatever. And you can change the names. You can change the place names. You can change the result of the song, if you like, because it's there for entertainment purposes. And its important function is to make people enjoy it. That's very different to a song or a poem or a, a, a tract which is passed from generation to generation orally to pass information on. So in genealogy, you can't change a name three generations back because very shortly it buggers up the genealogy in a couple of generations. In the same way, in, 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 even more particularly so in, in law, in the, the old Brehan laws, um, most of which are lost now, the largest tract we have is the tract on beekeeping. But they were very specific, and if, if you changed one word, well, you'd make an ass of the law within two or three generations. So the imperative is to keep the thing true to what has been passed on to you. It's different, in, in the imperative is different in a written society, uh, uh, visually, because somebody can come along and correct it, because the older version is there and the new version is there. But in an oral tradition, the oral version is gone, lost. So you have nothing to compare the new version with the wrong word against. Unless, unless you have studied and learnt all these metres um, and all these rhythms and syllabic formulae and so on, so that you know there's something wrong in what you're presented with. So in this day, uh, 2021, uh, this winter, this dreary old day here, We've just gone through a period of time with the American election and the whole concept of uh, fake news and all that kind of stuff. But you have digital records of what people said and so on and so forth. In 500 years ago, there was nothing like that. It's just hearsay what somebody said 100 years before it. There's no written account if you're in an oral tradition. So that's why the oral thing is very important. And I mentioned before why it was important to give the root of something in our culture. So and so came from such and such a family who this, that and so on. That tune came from, that story came from, that thing was invented by. Because that's your way of judging how the value of that piece of information is, how true it is, how good it is, how bad it is, if the source was not good, uh, and so on. So you need to have the root always attached if you're going to stick within our, our culture and our tradition. So that's why I'm saying... That's what I'm explaining tonight, that in different cultures, very basic fundamental concepts can change. In Western civilization, where rules and regulations are there, we have things about truth where you swear in the Bible, this is supposed to frighten you, uh, into saying the truth, but there's no guarantee you're going to tell the truth. But there are rules and regulations and laws going with it, and it's called perjury if you do it in court. That's the way that is handled in Western civilization. But in, 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 in the Irish indigenous civilization, when it was functioning, the imperative was completely different. It was not fear of being castig uh, castigated or uh, punished for telling the, a lie. It was the fear that you would bugger up the stream of knowledge and information from one generation to the next. And since you depended on it completely to be accurate for your own li livelihood and for your children, you kept with that also. You were morally obliged to keep with it. So obviously there were occasions during history when hagiography was taking place and people tried to claim relations to various other important people like Noah or Fiu McCool or somebody, something like that. And back then, of course, obviously people tried to steal other people's work and concepts and ideas as well, but they, it was not socially acceptable. So that's to understand tonight we're talking about the importance of the different ways that something like truth is handled and why. Shine Gudin Hidlaila, uh Bimdi Kinder Avraila and uh Adera took me to Gudi Kunz Kyolhuma. So that's it for this talk. We'll come back to several subjects like this before we have developed a common understanding of language we're using in these talks, and then we'll start the nitty gritty of talking about creativity and composition and maybe spirituality also. Gurmagav, particularly my patrons. Yeah.